Yes, it's Saturday, Cat Day. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us on our sunrise safari, uh, safari this morning as we are sitting here at uh, Treehouse Dam. And uh, just listening out, we are going to try and see what we can find uh, this morning around this area. We're going to go to Twin Dams to see if we're going to get any lucky, any luck with uh, those Nkuma prides around here at Juma Private Game Reserve in the Swabi Sands, South Africa. Good morning, everybody. My name is Cedric, and behind the camera with me on Rusty, we've got a BK. So, yes, thank you, thank you. So, I'm just going to sit here for a little bit, but not for too long, because I just want to find out exactly um, what's been happening around here. I, I do hear hyenas calling quite a bit uh, to the east of us towards Twin Dams. So I'm just going to sit here for another minute and just enjoy the setting. But yeah, joining us this morning on Wendy, we're going to have uh, Steve and Gert, but they won't be out uh, uh, for the beginning of the show on Wendy. Unfortunately, Wendy is just being uh, tweaked on, so I think there's one or two little issues there that we're sorting out, but uh, I think uh, Steve might join us in the tent. So yes, don't worry, he has not disappeared. He will jump on board very shortly but yes this is live this is interactive and uh, uh, this is live this is interactive and uh, if you are watching on uh, the wild earth uh, website uh, on wild earth TV um, yeah just send your questions and comments in there make sure that you do register and if you are watching on the YouTube uh, channel or hashtag Wild Earth, and you can have a chat with us this morning on a Saturday cat today. Got a nice old Mr. Hippo here at Trials Dam. I think somebody's just trying to get hold of me here quickly. I just want to double check him. Uh, Dion, Dion. Uh, Dion, Dion. Oh, I think I missed that message. All right, I think let's get get going. I think while the morning is still young and all that, let's try and get going and let's see what we can find around here. Uh, as I said, I am going to try and look for those in Kuhumas, try and follow up on them. And uh, see. Oh, I forgot. I did not even introduce our wonderful, wonderful team there in uh, Johannesburg. So of course. Uh, our director for this morning will be uh, Gwyn and our tech is uh, Simba. Yeah, there we go. All right, let's move. Let's go and take a look. Let's see what's happening. I'm going to go to the last location for that uh, mail line. That we had yesterday, the Telemati boy, that young male. I'm going to take a look around there and see if anything, any luck that's. You can see the buffaloes have come through here. Yolandi, yes, it's going to be a lovely morning. I can't wait. It's going to be fantastic. I'm just going to take a look and uh, see if we can find these cats early on. Uh, that's going to be the main uh, task for now. Oh, yes, there's always other things to see. If we get other stuff, we always will stop around and take a look. But I think uh, we all want to try and follow up on what's been happening with Nguma Pride, what's been happening with the Talamati young male, Okanya. So... Yeah, that is the main thing. I know that somebody said, uh, gave me an update earlier on, uh, saying that uh, line tracks went south from Twin Dams into Little Gary, but then he tried to get hold of me again. But yeah, let's go and take a look at the weather today. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Hello and welcome to the tent. Welcome here to Juma Private Game Reserve in the Cyber Sand. My name is Steve and I'm joined by Gat all the way over there on camera. I just had a few charging issues on the vehicle. Uh, the vehicle, Wendy, 
will be up and running in the next 25 minutes to 30 minutes and then we'll go out there and see if we can find some buffalo but for now we're in the tent and we'd love to hear your questions and your comments i have found a very nice little object just out on the tree over there so i'm going to ask gwen if she wouldn't mind going to the microscope and once we are on the microscope we can have a little look see at what on earth is it that i have put here this morning what are we looking at i wonder if anybody can tell exactly what it is that's going on over here difficult to see really but it looks like some space invader sort of landscape from outer space wouldn't you think hard <laughs> now what we're looking at everybody is just a little bit of lichen that I gouged off of one of the tree barks one of the russet bush willows and what is a lichen now, obviously we get to see many many different species of lichen there are many of them around the world I mean there's over 4,000 species I think um, classified around the world they occur in wide variety of habitats uh, around the world from pretty dry areas to very moist areas and what is a lichen ex exactly they are a symbiotic relationship between algae and fungi that is it in a nutshell very simple but a little bit more complex definition they are a complex life form that is a symbiotic partnership of two separate organisms a fungus and an algae the dominant partner is the fungus which gives the lichen the majority of its characteristics from its thallus shape to its fruiting bodies okay so the fungus helps it to create spores and reproduce and the algae produces the green which helps it to photosynthesize and so produce its own food um, now walking out and about in the morning these these um these like it is a nice ant these like a normally desk oh hello what a magnificent little ant that is um theo are they related to mushrooms well a lichen theo is a symbiotic relationship between fungus and algae so um mushrooms are fungus and the mycelium that are developed through the growth of the whole mushroom composite itself the mushroom itself is only the fruiting body so in lichen the fruiting body that happens is from the fungus that happens in there whereas the algae uh, does the photosynthesis now when the environment is a little bit dry um, you'll notice these algae or should i say the lichen can get a bit desiccated but sometimes in the early morning when there's a bit of dew a bit of condensation you'll actually notice that it expands and opens up has the ability to absorb a huge amount of its moisture from the surrounding area. <laughs> Barbara Brown, it looks like a disease, doesn't it? Just a little bit of gray um, green to the naked eye and under the microscope we see all of these different layers. Um, amazing. So those of you who've probably heard the word symbiosis before, symbiosis is the relationship between two organisms. Um, and in this case, it is a mutual symbiosis because the bacteria, sorry, the algae and the fungi rely on each other for survival. It allows them to survive in areas they wouldn't normally survive in. We all know algae lives in water and we know fungus can live in all different types of areas. But without the two together, they wouldn't be able to grow off of rocks. They wouldn't be able to grow off of trees and they wouldn't be able to do what they do. So another de definition of a lichen is a plant-like organism that typically, typically forms a low, crusty, leaf-like or branching growth on rocks, walls and trees. So many of you have seen lichen in your life. You might not have actually noticed it, but there are so many different species. Josh, no, it's all around. Um, generally, in many of the areas that we hang out in, you'll find lichen on the southern, especially here in South Africa, on the southern facing slopes or on shaded sides of rock faces, buildings or trees. Because in the southern hemisphere, uh, the sun is more in the north, so we actually get lichen that grows on the southern side because it's cooler and more shadier and there's more moisture. In the northern hemisphere, it's a complete opposite side, um, but there are some lichen species that can grow quite well in the heat. So don't let that be your guiding determinant that it's lichen or not. If you see some colorful looking substance growing on a rock or a tree, go have a closer look and investigate. You never know, it might be a new species of lichen.
All right, so we're still following up on uh, the lions. Uh, it sounds like the guys have got some lions inside uh, Little Gauri, and this is the property that's just to the uh, to the right of me, yeah, just to the south of Juma, where we cannot go into. But he says he heard others this side here now. So Trias Dam, Twin Dams. So we're going to quickly just have a little bit of a scan around here. You can actually see where the buffalo are running around that side, just behind us. And then I think they went back in and they might have headed towards uh, Twin Dam side. So let's go and take a little bit of a look around. I just want to see if we can get some, some life here somewhere. That's why it's so important always coming out early in the morning and try and get these uh, nocturnal animals like the lions or the leopard that's still moving around, still doing the patrolling and all that. And it's always good just to get out early enough to take a look at the side. So I don't see anything. I see lions going in there and they're going that side. Hoping it's going to be a good cat today. I'll tell you, yesterday was a fantastic feline Friday, so... Dams will be the best place to go and take a look at the moment. Twin Dams between Trials Dam. Trials Dam is directly here and now north of us. Trials Dam towards Twin Dams. And go look around that side. It's a lovely, it's fresh this morning. Uh, BK and myself, we both got, he's got his uh, nice jersey on. I've got a, a fleece on this morning. It just feels that the, you know, the temperatures in the morning now is becoming nice and fresh. It's almost like the change in the uh, season now for us. Uh, slowly but surely getting into those fresh early mornings, which is lovely. I do enjoy it. And then all of a sudden, when that sun comes out, it just starts heating up very quickly. Uh, Telemati, Anna Marie, Telemati, young males inside Little Gary too. Um, uh, yeah, unfortunately, he is uh, with he is actually with uh, with uh, one or two of the Nkuhuma females. I'm just trying to, trying to get a little bit of a better update on that, but it seems like he is inside. Yeah. So uh, yeah, he is, uh, he is inside of uh, Little Gauri. Maybe he'll come north, you never know. Maybe he'll come north for us. He might uh, decide to end up the side. I just want to see. Uh, what is up here? Hello. Hello to her. Yeah, this is the other one. Is it that side? Is it okay? How many? Oh, the former fuzzies? Mm. All right. I'm going to quickly go twin downs. I'm going to to take a look here. All right, hundred percent. All right, thank you, thanks, Abi, thanks, folks. Have a lovely morning, eh? Bye, bye. <laughs> Sorry, I just uh, chatted to one of the guides quickly there. Just want to find out. So it's only four females and a Telamati young male that was seen now in a little gari. So four of them are not here at the moment. Four are missing. Actually, five. Well, I'm sure Chilla's back at the den. I won't be surprised. Uh, Chilla's back at the den site.
Kieran, uh, I think the closest so far is this Talamati male. I think that's going to be the closest of the males coming to that den site, which is not good. I mean, that Talamati male will he, he will kill. Unfortunately, it's instinct. He will, if it's not it's not his cub. It's you know, it's not uh, cubs that he knows, and um, yeah, typical instinct. But you know, sometimes the females will defend. Uh, defend their cubs, and I'm sure Chela and the entire Nkuhuma pride of females will be, if they are there, they will give him a, a hiding. Um, but uh, he is, it seems like his tracks went them straight south, they went further south there, so he hasn't been this side. But he's been, the, to me, he's been the closest so far. Black tail males, no idea where those boys are, they need to, also need to start showing face here. Especially that they've got uh, an off offspring here. You know, they've got their youngsters aside. I think those black tail males need to jump on board here yeah, and also take a look on, uh, on protecting this area from other males. A lot of lion tracks going up and down here, yeah, up and down here. Yeah. I mean, we'll just keep an eye out. Loads of tracks. Mm. Oh, a big track there as well. Hopefully that's not a male's track, but anyway, let's we will try and investigate shortly. Just gonna go slowly around the dam area. Just wanna double check here. Do you miss a fire girl? I'm not too sure how young the telemarty male is. I think he's about four and a half. Maybe four, four, say four and a half. I, I, rough estimate, four and a half. Four and a half. I'm sure Gwen will get some uh, answers on that uh, via social media and she will uh, let you know ASAP. Slowly ambling along here now. Just do, do a little bit of a loop around uh, this dam, twin dam, just to see if we get any other tracks coming up here. I just uh, might just sit a little bit at the dam wall, on the dying dam wall, and then we can actually listen. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, thanks for the answer. So just you just turned five, so yeah, five years old. That's uh, the age of the young Telemarty male. No, it's coming up to five years old. All right, let's just pop here, and we can just sit back and listen out a little bit. Always good to use the senses, sense of hearing, sense of smell, and then you just sit back and see what we can pick up on. I must have just enjoy this beautiful Saturday morning. Uh, 
Uh, send him on. All right, copy. Thank you so much. Oh, you got the black day uh, mails? No, negative. Okay, copy. Uh, we're just going to sit here at Twin Dams at the moment and listen out. Thanks so much. Uh. Well, so just have an update quickly the Black Day. So exactly I was talking about the Black Day males. They need to kind of show face here. They need to come and uh, take a look here because this is part of their territory, those boys. And uh, it seems like one of them is just here yeah, south inside once again, Little Gari. <laughs> it seems like they're all inside Little Gari. And we cannot go there, so, but it's not too far from here. And then, of course, got uh, Shudulu and uh, Nene. That's uh, a female leopard with a young boy. That's uh, also in Hoffman, just south of uh, Juma. But um, he's going to tell me if there is any visual from uh, the main road. Well, thanks, Setters. You're back here with us in the tent and probably noticed this black gem of goodness on the end of the table. It is some charcoal that I just fished out of the Fireside Chat fireplace just towards the back over there. And you might wonder, what on earth are we doing with charcoal? Now, charcoal is a big buzzword around the world at the moment, everybody. It is, um, there's huge health benefits with regards to charcoal, activated charcoal. And you can actually make your own activated charcoal at home. Obviously, the first step is to to burn it. You need the wood. You need the charcoal itself. Um, I've put some underneath the microscope, so you can kind of see the layers of the activate or the charcoal there. You can see them. You sort of see how it's just basically wood that's been burnt. That's what it looks like. Now, how on earth do you make activated charcoal? First of all, you need the burnt wood. You let it cool, so you just harvest it from a fireplace, it cools quite nicely. Uh, wash it just to get off any of the impurities, any of the dust, any of the ash. Um, when the charcoal is dry, you can grind it down into a fine powder, and then you can add a combination of calcium chloride and water, and uh, then you can cook it. Uh, once you've got that, you can then either just keep it in a jar, uh, use little teaspoons of it, or you can put it into little capsules. I know you can go to many pharmacies, you can buy these little capsules that uh, um, people use for making pills or for adding things in to make a pill. And you can put them in there and you can take a couple tablets whenever things are, are going wrong for you. Jojo, your mom used to do it? Fantastic. Did she make the activated charcoal? Now the benefits behind it are, are quite profound. I mean, you, you can't really see it when you look at the image on the on the screen, but um, the benefits of activated charcoal has been well known in for history with regards to poisoning. If ever you have something or you're feeling ill, you've taken something, you're not very sure about whether or not this is going to be something good for your digestion, take a couple tablets of activated charcoal and that will sort it out. It's really good for kidney function, um, it extracts the urea out of the system so it can help with the kidney function and if you've ingested anything that's going to make you quite sick. So when it comes to diarrhea, when the body's just voiding itself, activated charcoal for the win. So there are a multitude of benefits um, with activated charcoal. I mean, I'm, I'm researching it as we go along as well, but taking it in the long term, I reckon it's relatively safe. There's no real issue about it. Um, and it hasn't really been recommended for detoxing, um, although um, the body is the natural detoxer. But when you've taken something that, you know, it was prescribed if you get poisoned. If you get poisoned, straight away you need activated charcoal. Uh, and that's the best way to go. I know a friend of mine just recently had a very, very bad tummy bug. Her partner had one just before her. And, I mean, he lost seven kilograms in five days because his body just voided. It just let go of everything. And she knew something was going to happen to her. So she just started taking activated charcoal. And, yeah, she got, she got sick, but nowhere near to the degree that he got to. 
and charcoal is so available everybody it's so available um, and there's so many other uses we can use for it I can make a very nice little water purifier if I'm out on trail take a couple bit of the charcoal from my fireplace take a bottle cut the, the bottom of the bottle turn it upside down so there's the the lid part here just shove that area there with the charcoal put some pebbles put some sand take some water pour it in straight into my cup drink it essentially everything will be good to go All right, so I'm still, I'm going actually now west again, just to see if we can get visual of uh, Shudulu and Nene <clears throat> from the service road, yeah, from Gary Main. And apparently they might just be inside of Hoffman's, another property that's just south of Juma. I'm gonna see if we can get uh, a visual on them. Um, but other than that, those are the black tail male, one black tail male is just inside here and look is open, which is good. I'm um, very happy for that. It looks like this. But it's only one. I don't know where the other one is. But those guys, they're going to follow up. They'll keep me updated on uh, those lions. Um, all I can do is uh, wait for information from them. That's about that. But I think I'm going to go west. Buffalo tracks are going west. And... Uh, Uh, sorry, Gwen, I can't hear you at all. I just heard Lola. Uh, Lola, uh, lion and leopard tents don't look different to each other. They'll decide where they want to have their cubs and uh, hide their cubs. I think it's all pretty much the same idea it's all the same idea making sure that they are out of sight of other predators tucked away somewhere in a thick bush maybe in a rocky outcrop so it's all the same all the same Maybe my earpiece, or I don't know. Yeah. I just said Kenneth uh, Shadulu to Nene. Nene. Uh, oh, Shadulu. <clears throat> no, 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 I don't think so. It's not uh, more to the daughter. If, uh, maybe if Nene was uh, a female, different story. I think if uh, Nene was a female, then it's a different story. Then it's usually that the mom will give part of the territory to. Her daughter, but remember, male and female, they do not have anything, uh, they don't uh, compete for territory at all. No, it's male against male, female against female. So, uh, not male and female. Male will love to have female females in his territory. The more, the better. Spread the genes. to get there is this road <laughs> corrugations on this road ah! yeah I'm trying to guide all right onto the side a bit less corrugation yeah
lot of these uh, buffalo tracks around here. So I just want to take a look here. So this is exactly loads of buffaloes coming back and forth here over this uh, area. So I'm just going to take a look. I'm just going to take a look exactly <coughs> this side. You can see all the dung here and you can see they've been running up and down, back and forth, going north, going south. Got lion tracks here as well. So what I'm going to do, I think I'm going to feel that I need to go around a bit. What do you think, Beaks? We try Philemon's, no, not so easy. Uh, Philemon's cut line, rather. Let's do that one. I think Philemon's cut line is going to be the best area to go and see if we can pick up on these buffaloes. A lot of activity here. <laughs> And see, these ones are going straight north. Darcy Miller, <laughs> it seems like uh, little guy is having the animal party this morning. Um, it definitely seems that uh, that way. Uh, that's what I want to just give this one a go yeah. I just want to go back into go back into Juma and go north Track there. I'm going north here. I think we gotta take a look at the side. Lenny, no, no other updates on quarantine. I got no idea. Last I heard was that day when they said that uh, he was uh, relocated, uh, well, they said 10 kilometers from that uh, picnic spot. So, and I mean, 10 kilometers is not much for a male leopard, it's not much at all. It's part of the territory as it is. So, uh, I, don't, I don't get the, the thought process behind that. No idea. Unfortunately, that's, uh, that's, I'll just, uh, I'll just smile and wave at that situation. No idea. You relocate a, a male leopard 10 kilometers from there, especially quarantine. I mean, he'll just, uh, he'll just go back there again. He'll be there like the next, he'll be there uh, the next day. I'm back at the same spot, so. Let's go up Philemon's cut line. This is exactly what I want to do now. I want to just go up here just to see if those buffaloes did not come further north. Oh, that's it on your side. Oh, line tracks, eh? Yeah, I see a line came down, yeah. Ah. All right, see, they came, the lines came down this side. I want to see, uh, yeah, it's just a one male, it's a one male, one male, one male. All right, let's just go a little bit further up. I just want to see exactly where these buffaloes have crossed into Juma. I wonder if uh, Steve, I'm sure Steve is getting ready on Wendy. I wonder if uh, 
sure they will be almost out. I'll just see if I can get an update on Steve. Clean the grass, yeah. Uh, just in the grass, right? Yeah, it's just a bird. Yeah, don't worry, it's not a lion, <laughs> it's a bird. A little Koki Franklin, but it's a female. It doesn't want to focus now. It doesn't want to zoom out. Oh, there. Sorry about that, looks like. All right, there. He's not zooming in. Oh. All right, well. <laughs> uh, well, it's all right. We'll just see it from there. The camera's, uh, the camera's not cameraing. <laughs> It's still a nice, nice little female Koki Franklin. It's just, just the one, just the female. I'm just letting Gwen know that the the camera is not uh, zooming in and out at the moment. Picking away at some of the seeds on the ground. <laughs> All right, so I guess we are just stuck here for the time being until we can get a chance to restart the camera. All right, it looks like good timing. Steve, it uh, looks like Wendy and Steve, everybody's ready that side. So let's head over to Steve uh, to see what's happening on his side. <laughs> well, good morning again, everybody. We've shopped the tent for some wheels. We're on the move. And we heard lions calling. I don't know where exactly Cedric is now. I think I heard Gwen say something about Philemon's cut line. I was quite keen to follow up on the buffalo this morning because we know what happens when you find buffalo sometimes. You sometimes find lions. I'm just going to double check where Cedric is so that we don't bump into each other. Cedric, Cedric. Not that it's a problem if we bump into each other. Morning, bud. What's your location and route from there? I'm coming down Zoe's. I'll come and give you a hand. Thank you. Okay, so Buffalo Mission it is. Buffalo Mission it is. Nice elephant activity here last night. Some tracks. Mm, there's always that potential in the morning here everybody. You never know what you might come across. We had Tortoise Pan yesterday morning. He walked here and cut to straight there. Christina, these vehicles used to have GPS's on back in the day. Ah, see, there's the buffalo tracks coming straight across. Ooh, it's actually quite a nice sort of, quite a nice image. Is it a nice image? 
So these vehicles used to have GPS on. That was for the tech guys to see where we are and where everything's happening. Um, I'm not sure if many of the other safari vehicles that you find in and around actually have GPSs on. Um, it's possible. I know many of the guys, every, everybody's got a phone these days. So yes, every vehicle's got a GPS. Okay, so those are the buffalo that came in from the northern side here, probably last night. Um, and they headed down towards Treehouse Dam, and they were located there last night. So we're going to follow up, give Cedric a hand, see where the herd of buffalo have gotten to, um, whether they're still on Druma or not. They've sort of mulled around here. They went through this sort of area. I don't know how big the herd was, but on our way back last night, there was... Oh, see, these buffalo are up and down. On our way back last night, there was lots of activity, lots of tracks on uh, on our way back to camp. Lots of dung and tracks of a decent sized herd of buffalo. Liam, you know, Leopards will sometimes follow buffalo to try and pick up on maybe a young calf or something. Um, in some areas, hyenas hunt buffalo. Some areas, wild dogs hunt buffalo. That's in, in extreme cases. It's not really common, but it does happen from time to time. In the Mara, we saw hyenas hunting, and I've heard of large packs of wild dog hunting buffalo. Um, so there's a nice, fresh buffalo pat. Where are you guys? Are you going this way? Not the most difficult group to track, herd of buffalo. We talk about it all the time. Probably the easier of the big five to find. Oh, we've got a little, some horns sticking out on the, the grass there. Gart, can you see him? Tell me, well, see, so there was a hole. Uh, come back a little bit. It's not a buffalo. It's just the horns of a majestic antelope species. I wonder if you can see him in the thickets, everyone. Pay attention. Pay attention. Here he comes. There he is. A lovely kudubu. Taking things nice and slowly this morning. So if he doesn't move, you don't see him. The way that the light glistens off of the horns is often what I see. But it could have just been sticks sticking out of the ground there. Lovely kudu bull in this early morning. A nice fresh breeze out today. <laughs> and uh, it takes practice, but yes, it, we do see those little things that just aren't quite right. You know, that's what I saw. I didn't actually see the kudu. I saw something that wasn't quite right, and then I looked again, and then it was obvious. So the loudest of the Tragalaphus species, everybody, you hear me say Tragalaphus, it's the genus. And uh, all the Tragalaphus species, the eland, the kudu, the nyala and the bushbuck, have got spiral horns and their hooves directly register when they walk. That means that their front foot steps on their back foot. And I've never heard an eland alarm call. I've never heard an eland make a very loud call. But kudu make a very loud bark. Nyala make a decent bark as well. And then bushbuck make a bark, but it's a lot softer. All three are pretty loud, but the kudu is very booming. Um, the nyala is booming, but 
little bit less so, as you could probably imagine it's a small animal. And then the bush buck sounds very much like a dog. One of those alarm calls, very, very accurate. And many times we found a predator, be it lion or leopard, due to the alarm calls of one of our kudu nyala or bushbuck species. Right, no luck as of yet. I know Steve is going to come back down in this area as well. So, uh, to see if he's going to work one or two other areas, and I'm going to work one or two other areas. Just to see what we can find. But I've got a feeling that these buffaloes have gone south into Little Gauri. Hoffman's Little Gauri. Another property that's all south of Juma. Standing by there, go, uh, Orbs. trying to pick up on from the other guys and uh, if they've got any updates for us this uh, morning from that side. Uh, it doesn't look like there's any. at the uh, Trials Dam and, uh, and listen that side. Uh, Liam, no, buffaloes won't move with other antelope like uh, that folder beast. Uh, he usually moves around with impalas and that. Uh, buffaloes won't. Buffaloes will just uh, tend to move uh, if it's by themselves. Like you saw the male the other day, all by himself. He hasn't got really any other thing that he's going to be moving around with. Oh, they'll move in those big herds. Or like a bachelor herd, so like males. We'll get like a few males together. Let's go take a look again here at Trials Dam. I just want to double check here. I was say that one of the black dam males is missing, so. Batisse, yes, only if, they, only if the animals did know the boundaries. It's like, okay. You know, it's a sunrise safari, let's get back to Juma, everybody. That would be very nice. Unfortunately, that is uh, not the case. Beaks, I think, let's do elephant carcass. I think that side, because remember, uh, um, this Debo has also left her Tlalamba in that area last night. So I want to just go double check there. Maybe she, she did make a kill during the night and hoisted, or hopefully hoisted something up there. That would be nice, and we can actually pick up on her.
lot of funny clouds coming through here now. Getting a little bit cooler for the morning. Sandra, I don't think there's any reason for them to split up. I think sometimes it's just uh, they split up. Maybe one is busy mating with a female somewhere else. Maybe other males kind of, um, you know, chased him some from some uh, area and they all ran different directions. Uh, I'm just looking that side. So I'm not too sure what's happening with uh, Wendy again. I think they're just trying to sort signal out or something there. I'm not getting any info on that. Sorry, Pete, what have you got there? I would say just in glow, we're crossing from the Hulda to the Juma now. We're going towards the Hulda Dam side here, so that's quite on the boundary. Uh, okay, copy. Thanks, Pete. Slowly down this side because this is exactly where Steve left uh, Tlalamba in this block last night. And uh, so I'm going to come past here very s slowly. Maybe if she, hopefully she did make a kill, that'll be fantastic. And then, uh, well, get her up in the tree somewhere. That would be just perfect for this Saturday morning. Like almost like a drag mark here. It's gonna go back a bit. Oh, I'm just gonna see if I can get out quickly jump off here. Sorry, it just looks like a drag mark. It looks like it, I'm not too sure if it is. I'll just double check on this. Hmm, yeah. Female leopard track dragged. All right. Well, I'm not going to try and follow up on this now because I'm not getting a chance. But yeah, clearly a female leopard track dragging something across because you can see where the grass is actually pushed down here. So you can see, yeah, you can see from your side, Abe, you can see where it's actually something been pushed over here, I dragged this side, you got the female leopard track here, I'm dragging 
over here and you can see the grass has been pushed flat. So I'm going to try and take a walk now. Exactly where. I'm going to go very, very slowly in here. Alright, I'll wait when we can get a chance to start tracking here quickly and I will go and take a walk. Nice, I don't know what it was. Well, welcome back everybody. I'll come back live here to Juma where we are eagerly anticipating the beginning of the rutting season. A male impala. We arrived on the scene and these guys were a little bit boisterous with each other. You'll notice that they sort of there's a distance between them, a meter or two meters between them. They won't get very close to each other. They just want to fight. As soon as one moves towards the other one, the other one moves out the way. That's the younger one moving there. They get to that point where the testosterone is starting to build up. They're starting to build up their condition. They know that within the next month that something's going to start happening. The, the next full moon in sort of April through to May, there's like a, a two month period where everything just starts going a bit crazy. It can go as long as June, but it's the first full moon in May and then the second full moon in May. So it might start in April and then end late May, depending on how the moon aligns. That's when the females come into estrus and for the next few weeks, next month and a half, two months, these males are just going to go absolutely crazy. So it's the calm before the storm. Right now, they're hanging out in little bachelor groups, building up condition, feeding. feeding and building up their condition so that when it comes time to fight they are strong and henry you know i don't know if sparring is the only way they prepare well they spar with each other but they also spar with bushes and small shrubs which they will thrash at and damage and then they will practice with each other and it's helpful to practice in small little groups with other individuals that are of equal star size and stature before going off and declaring your own little spot. You need to be well practiced and well versed to do so. And when you are hanging out with other individuals, well, the chances of it being you that a predator picks off is lessened. As soon as one of these individuals declares his own little area, his vigilance goes through the roof. First of all, he's trying to see every male that's approaching his area to fend him off. He's trying to see every female that approaches his area to keep her in the area and then well, he seems to forget that he's actually meat and he gets eaten. And uh, from now until about June, we see a massive increase in the mortality of male impala. It's because of the rat. As soon as they start making those noises, that really strange gurgling, growling, roaring sound, you actually see predators move towards them. I've seen many times lions hunting on sound alone because they know how distracted these impala are so in the coming months you'll notice many of the impala that are caught by leopard and lion are going to be male it's a proportion that happens in the rutting season obviously the lambing season is finished from november until a couple of weeks ago the lambs were at the top of the food chain or should i say top of the meal list for predators and then during the, the height of pregnancy, the females in their later stages of pregnancy were obviously a little bit more targeted. So there's a balance. Balance in the scales throughout the season. Yeah, man, they just chewed him off. See, they're not friendly. They hang out together because it's beneficial to do so, but they don't like each other one a bit. They all competition. Martin, the harems will be formed as the coming weeks move on. 
Um, and essentially what happens is the biggest, strongest males will demarcate the most resource rich area that has access to good food and access to the prime habitat that it parlors favor. And uh, those individuals will vie for the best places. Now that will attract the females and then the male will do his utmost best to keep them inside of that area until he's able to mate with as many of them as he can. The problem is, is some of them are off the blocks a bit too soon and they demarcate an area that in the time when the females are still a month and a half from ovulation. So there's going to be no receptivity to him. Uh, and eventually he loses condition and either gets ousted by another male or he gets caught by predator and uh, his genetics lost. So those individuals who stay in these little bachelor groups until right before the ovulation starts and then they claim a spot, they have the best opportunity of sowing their seed. But it's the area that they demarcate or or secure for themselves that attracts the females in and then the job of keeping them there is another story altogether they get so busy running around keeping the females in chasing off males they forget to eat and they lose condition so many males who go through the rutting season don't survive to the next year Okay, well there they are. They are shoveling their mouth full. Mitch, essentially, okay, we're going to show you now. This, have a look at this eco tone that we have here. You see, on the left, we have the thicket, and on the right, we have the open area. Now, this is what we call an ecotone, it is perfect impala habitat. So the impala males will basically be demarcating an area that encompasses a bit of both, a bit of shelter, a bit of food uh, in the thickets and the open area. And so they'll be demarcating territories or short term territories along these ecotones or ecozones where the, the, there's a massive transition from open to thicket. And obviously when it is windy and when conditions are unsuitable, they can come out into the open and keep safe. And when they want to go feed and keep out of the heat of the day, they can go into the thickets and feed. So the rutting often happens or the big display often happens out in the open because the males are very, very boisterous. They're posturing, they're showing how big they are, they're jumping around, they're making lots of noises and they want to be visibly seen by the female. So they'll go through those displays of chasing each other around and dominating each other until each of them individually secures the right little patch. Okay, and there are lots of eco zones, eco tones here in the Sabi Sand Reserve. Many of them are on our fire breaks. This is essentially a fire break that's been created so as to prevent natural yet unprepared for fires from coming through and burning down the whole place. And many of our water points have also got these open areas around them. So many, many habitats have been created in Sabi Sand Wildlife Reserve that are very suitable for Impala. Hence why we have so many. But this will be a story that will be playing on for the next couple of months. So if you looked at them now and thought, oh, that's pretty calm. What are you talking about the rut? Wait, you will see. Hello, Brandon. A biome is a broad ecological unit made up of um, specific vegetation that has um, a specific type of climate. So for example, the savanna biome is a broad ecological unit that is a summer rainfall, uh, a specific variation of rainfall, and it has a mix of trees and grasses. Um, the Karoo is also summer rainfall, um, but it's a much lower rainfall and it's made up of sort of forbs and grasses and spiny little plants. Um, the grassland biome is also summer rainfall, but it occurs sometimes at high altitude where there's prevalence of frost 
and it is obviously absent for the most part of trees and can have a little bit more higher rainfall. So the geology can be different across that landscape, um, but it does form quite an integral part in determining the habitats within a biome. Fainbos, for example, occurs on the western side of South Africa. It's got medium to high rainfall and it is winter rainfall and it occurs on different types of soils there. Depending on what soil type you have, will depend whether it's proteoid, whether it's ericaceous or whether it's rhinosterfelt. So the soil there plays a big part in determining the type of fainbos, but the winter rainfall is imperative. And you jump over the mountain in the Cape there into the succulent Karoo, and that is low winter rainfall and it's defined by small little succulent plants as the name succulent crew would uh, imply okay whereas an eco tone is the transition between a forest and a grassland so there's often a line you can sometimes see the line very very clearly i think the easiest way to describe it is the ocean the ocean has got eco tones that are changing all the time depending on the the tide and the, the degree of salt. So when you go to the beach, walk down onto the dune, you'll see that the dune's got vegetation, and then you come off of the dune, and then suddenly it's the beach with the sand, and you go down to the, the water's edge, and then you get the ocean, and depending how far in the sand goes, you find the rocks, and once you get the rocks, you can get different ecotones on those rocks that are very, very narrowly spaced apart, depending on the tide and the salinity. So it's very obvious in the ocean. Um, Often forests transition from a forest into sort of a small little thicket and then into grassland. So it's the transition zone between two habitat types. Whereas in a biome, a biome is huge and it's got many, many, many different habitat types. The Kruger National Park itself has got 38 or 40 vegetation units, a different type of vegetation units. And within them, lots of different habitats and within them lots of different eco tones where those habitats are shifting okay i hope that makes sense Thank you, Steve. Uh, I tried to follow up on that drag mark, but it's difficult. It looks like it might have become north or it could have gone south into that drainage line. <clears throat> no luck there at this point in time. So I'm just, just quickly doing a, a block around here. I just, I just want to see if uh, she hasn't come out again or if she hasn't dragged whatever she was dragging there into this area. too sure what it was it's difficult to say because I saw one track of hers and that was about that Maybe they, if they're usually dragging something substantial something heavy you know you'll actually see like the um, the divots that the paws make will be quite uh, quite prominent but uh, didn't see much of that And I think those buffaloes as well, a little bit earlier, has all gone south. Oh, going south. Uh, well, Justin, first thing you'll look for is the paws of the animal. So if it's a leopard or if it's a hyena that's dragging something, the direction of those paws, that's of course going into that direction. So that's the first thing you look at. Uh, very easy. And then if it's going into the grass, then of course you can't see any paws and you can just see which way the grass has been pushed down. It's been pushed down that way, it's going that way, it's pushed down that way, it's going that way. So, one or two things just to look out for. But yeah, the paw prints will be the, uh, you know, the, the given sign of uh, direction. Which way that carcass has been dragged. So 
Amazing, from all the crazy cats from yesterday morning and this uh, yesterday afternoon, all of a sudden everything has decided to jump off uh, Juma this morning. I just want to go towards the hyena den, <coughs> the one there at Twin Dams, uh, the Twin Dams hyena den. Uh, I just want to go double check there because uh, sometimes I just got a little bit of a feeling about something there. Something tells me, go Cedric, go and take a look. Yeah, June and June bug. That would be very nice. That would be very, very nice. But uh, no updates on them that side. So unfortunately, they're knocked around at the at their den or June's den, if you want to call it that. It's not too far from here, but they're not there. They might be down there, you know, June. She's very good with looking for carcasses. She might even be all the way down where that uh, and buffalo was killed from yesterday morning. Chewing on some bones there. Maybe it's the calm before the storm. Hey Beeks. Well Angie, as you can see yesterday there was uh Lamba was on the not too far from the Nkumas. Uh, she was just uh, north of the Nkumas. Uh, but sometimes you'll find if the line activity and buffalo activity is crazy on uh, on the property, you'll find that leopards tend to stay low. Stay low, stay out of sight. Not exposing themselves that easily, but I mean, then again, as I say, it's um, how many times have you seen? Well, you saw even yesterday morning, Torches Pan and uh, and Kumas together in one sighting. So. Last little turn up here and see. <laughs> and there's definitely one female lion track coming back north. Oh, there's all in south, one coming back up. And uh, I'm sure that the one that's coming back up here is uh, Chella coming back to the den. Well, that's a little bit further towards the drainage line on that side. There, there, there. No, nothing up here. All right, so as I said, I want to get try and get to that hyena den. It's just up north here. I just want to double check the little bit of a, f a feeling about that. Yeah, no, I don't uh, look at the hyena clans won't push each other away. Uh, if they're part of the same clan, they'll stick together. They'll never push each other away. They have to act like a clan. All one, one uh, hopefully happy family. Never know. 
most times it seems like they're always happy and they put all their cubs together I miss those times it was always nice having what was it nine cubs at one stage all together at these den sites <laughs> oh, let's get to the stadium. Yeah. Uh... Cooksters, yes, I'm looking at yeah as well because I'm in the drag mark for Columbus in this area, so I must have just double checking out. Yeah. I'm just double checking out. Yeah. Maybe dragged at this side of the drainage line. Now this is the old den site, the yeah, twin dam, if some of you remembered with our hina. But you can see all overgrown with grass. Um, yeah, you can see nothing has been using this uh, den site recently. Maybe one day that the Juma clan will come back here again and use this uh, den. All right, let's move on, let's move on. It doesn't seem too much happening around this side. Uh, While well, we got to continue moving on from here, let's head over to Steve. Thanks, setters. Well, we found where all the buffalo were hanging out and where they moved, but it looks like they've all gone south. We've gone back to little Gowrie side of the world. Their poo is all over the place here. So we're just coming down towards Treehouse Dam, just have a little look, see if there's anything moving around here. We're looking in the Tlalamba tree over here. Any Tlalamba in there? No? <laughs> Once you see a leopard in a tree, everybody, you always look in that tree, always, again and again and again. Just looking for the characteristic spots or shape. So much action on the property last night. It's like an on switch. Yesterday, a whole day actually. A couple of leopards, a couple of prides, a lion. Hello, Lauren, the oldest female leopard in the area. Um, Shadula was three and a half in 2018. So it makes a nine and a half. Um, Kuchava, I'm not 100% sure on Kuchava's age. Sabui as well, I'm not sure. I don't know. I'm oh, sorry, Lauren. I don't have all, all my information locked down in my head right now. But it most certain is not Lalamba. Um, Tandi was the aged queen. Uh, Kuchava is her daughter. But I don't know if um, Shadulu is older than Kuchava. I think Kuchava is older than Shadulu because she was already independent and I didn't really know much about her when I started here. And that's when Shadulu moved into the property from, from the south. 
previously known as the Ingrid Ingrid Dam Young Female, come from Ottawa on the Singita properties down south. And Kanyeni was probably one of the older females and she passed away last year, if not the year before. It's all a bit of a bubble. Sorry, Gwen, did you say Cedric agrees that it's Shadulu or Kuchava? Shadulu. Interesting. Interesting. Because I know that Tamba was older than, is younger than Kuchava. And Tamba was a three-year-old leopard when I got here, meaning he was the same age as, plus minus the same age as Shadulu, which makes Kuchava would have had to be a year and a half older. Ah, they are the same age, Kuchava and Shudulu. Now that doesn't make sense. How does Tamba fit into the picture? Well, Tamba is younger than Kuchava. Anyway, maths everybody, not my strong suit. Okay, so Subui 2013, Kuchava and Shadulu 2014. So, well done, Ghat, well done. Well done, Ghat wins the Bravo this morning. Whoopsie, watch out, I'm driving. Hands on the wheel, hands on the wheel. <laughs> okay, so... Franklin's alarm calling on the southern side of this drainage line here. Could be a mongoose. Could be something else. Could be Tlalamba heading towards her tree. Nice and slowly down the drainage. We just heard Franklin's erupting from the bush over here. Kudu ear time. up here a little bit see if maybe there's a track you know sometimes Franklins will fly away and then obviously they lose the leopard and then they stop performing but uh, lots of things frighten Franklins so Linda Franklins definitely are um, very alarm call prone uh, absolutely every predator out here will hunt a Franklin Spiffal. So they are quite jumpy. They are quite jumpy birds. Um, and their, their alarm calls can be reliable with regards to finding something. But like I say, so many things try to hunt them that you're not always sure what it is that they are alarm calling for. Guinea fowl also alarm call if you find them. They're not as common as the Franklin, although they are around. There's probably definitely more Franklin slash spur fowl in and around the landscape.
but most birds will alarm call to a degree. Um, if they see a mongoose or an owl or a snake, they will definitely respond. They won't all necessarily respond to a lion or a leopard. Sometimes they do. We'll just stop and have a little quiet scan around Treehouse Dam. Brilliant time to stop and have a little refreshment, a coffee, a stretch of the legs. Coming up in the other south, I'm actually heading towards Buffalo, well, Buffalo Zook Dam. I'm going to go and see what's happening around there. Apparently, the one gentleman said he had some elephants and two buffaloes there. So, and uh, maybe the crocodile might also be around there. So, yeah, let's head over to the, not too far from that uh, dam. And see if we can get that side. Little bit of a drizzle, very, very fine this morning. All of a sudden that's come in. It was like nice and clear, and now it's a bit of a drizzle. I was checking out, sorry, I thought I almost saw another drag one, but I could see it's elephant tracks going all up here. So sometimes they'll drag their feet or drag their trunk across here, and almost looks like a drag mark, but it wasn't. It was, uh, Elephant's trunk. This feels very airy this morning. It feels very funny. Alana, you say, fingers crossed that the weather's better at Buffalo Dam. Yeah, well, let's hope. Looks like a little bit uh, clearer out there towards Buffalzook Dam. Oh, so <laughs> Lana, you say, you're hoping that redders, ah, the baby hippos at Buffalzook Dam. So I thought you said the weather <laughs> is better. <laughs> Uh, yes, Ilana. Let's see if our redders is that side. It'll be nice just to see that youngster again. Um, I don't know. If he's not there, I've got a feeling it might be north of uh, Juma in Bifflesook uh, area, Bifflesook property. There is uh, that other big dam that's not too far north. And uh, oh, yeah, there's a lot of squirrels that's chirping in the engine area. So a lot of them actually happen on this side. Uh, I just want to say, uh, Uh, hi Pete. Uh, hi, uh, hi folks. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just one of my good old friends that side. So yeah, so we got to go try and get to Buffalo uh, Dam. And I don't know, there's a lot of vehicles here. Am I actually bumping a sighting here? Or... It doesn't look like it, uh, a big car. It doesn't, uh, I think it's just everyone's just driving around. Okay. All right, Niala North, here we come. So I do apologize in advance that uh, if we do have a breakup in uh, picture again, yeah? uh, that's due to a bad signal area.
All right, so we're almost at Biffelzook uh, Dam while we try and get to that dam. Let's head over to Steve-O. Thanks, Cedric. Well, we moved on from Treehouse Watering Hole. I'm going to go into the area Cedric said he saw a drag mark of Klalamba or whatever and uh, let's have a little look around. I think that sounds like a plan. We didn't have any more success with the alarm call. I heard those Franklins shouting and then they stopped. Always worth to investigate when you do hear alarm calls like that. Tracking is one thing, but alarm calls are very in the moment. I have found many a big cat through following up on bird alarms. Squirrels, not so much. And they definitely go back to areas that their moms raised them in, definitely. Uh, whether they choose a tree that their mom took them to, it's hard for me to say. Um, they definitely do like to hang out in the area that they're accustomed to, that they were raised in, especially the females. The drainage line, for example, you notice that uh, all of Tundi's cubs, including Tundi, was born in a very similar area. And that's where Tlalamba has chosen to do most of her denning. And uh, we found her very close to, to that area last night as well. So when it comes to denning, um, specific areas are selected. There's familiarity behind that. And no doubt certain trees fit the bill when it comes to that familiarity as well. The purpose of the tree is, is it just for chilling in or is it for hoisting? I don't think a leopard's going to go and deliberately leave this tree to go to a tree further away just because it knows it better. It'll choose a suitable tree that's nearby. But there might be specific trees on their territorial route that they might utilize. Oh, rubbing posts. So this jackal is being probably a little bit more protective than looking for an eagle for its food, which is very, very interesting. This is something I've never seen before, but looking at it closely now, it looks to be a tawny eagle by the fact that the gape on the mouth doesn't extend past the eye. But needless to say, it is an eagle that's landed on the ground. Uh, bat foxes being in the area denning choose their den sites very specifically for food resource uh, being harvested termites. So there's a good chance the tawny eagle or the eagle itself is walking around trying to snatch up some food in the form of insects and the jackal is having none of it. Snazzy, that is a very big bird, but if the bird pl doesn't play his cards right, the jackal could have it. Because uh, jackals are very, very quick, very, very fast, and they can bite quite powerfully. All right, Cubby Cubby, appreciate it, thank you. All right, uh, sorry, just quickly on the radio there. Oh, here we go, we have Pibbles of Dab. 
All right, copy. Thank you so much. All right, so we had Buffalzook Dam, and um, <laughs> it's very, very quiet here. I thought somebody said earlier there was elephants and a buffalo here, but uh, clearly they are not here. Let's see. I'm going to grab my binoculars. Let's see what we can find around at the dam. Let's see if we can find. Oh, there's hippo. Well, there's a hippo. Let's see how red is this here, that little hippo. Might pop its head up there. Might be mom. So let's see. Let's see if they get a little face that's going to come up there. There's another hippo. So that's a male. You can just see by the darkness around the eye area. And there's a female next to it. I'm just going to see if we see a little head. Wait patiently here now. Maybe at the back of that uh, that, that hippo, I see bubbles at the back. Oh, just at the back there. Maybe. Might be the young one. Okay, there comes the female now. Let's see now. Sometimes the young ones will come at the same time up as mom. Nothing. No. Peter, you say you like this uh, dam. Yeah, it's a lovely dam. We've had some great sightings, yeah, at this uh, dam on the northeastern corner of uh, Juma, or Biffleshook Dam. We had more white here the other day. There's a quick visual of him. Uh, crocodilia? No, I'm trying to look for the crocodile. I did see something coming towards us. There, there, there. Yeah. there see this little, little thing in my job here. That might be him. I see that. I've got a feeling that's a crocodile. I think we got him there, Pika. I think so. It looks very airy in there, like all those little bubbles coming out there. It's, it's coming closer and closer to us. Hmm. And we'll keep our eyes on on that. If it does surface, and I'll we'll see if it. Is the crocodile see if we are right? Amanda, how do they choose which waterholes they go to? The crocodiles they playing they play ching chong cha with each other and see which one wins and then yeah they don't all, they don't want to remain at that water and the other one has to leave. <laughs> no, I don't know. They just decide. One will decide. Oh well, I feel like uh, maybe there's too much pressure around the one water hole. Let's go to another one. Let's see if I can get to another a water body and might be lucky just uh, having that all to myself. Not in the elephants. Yes, I'm crashing in, of uh, trees and that behind us, but that's in the very thick bush. So I think that's where the elephants have gone to. I think they went behind the dam wall for now. Yeah, that's sad. 
No, I think he must be north. I think he's in the other, the other dam. Well, welcome back, everybody. Welcome back live to a nice overcast and semi-cool Juman. I just bearing in mind those of you who don't like spiders have arachnophobia maybe it's a great opportunity to look away the pioneers of the insect world the spider and here we have got the orb web we get two different types of orb web spiders we get the golden orb and we get the garden orb now I'm not going to tell you which one this is I'd like to see if any of you know but one of them has got a round abdomen like this one and the other one has got a very jagged abdomen almost like a starfish in a way around the bottom there obviously this one's got the round abdomen right now and both of them have very similar strategies very similar coloration the oranges and the blacks are very obvious they are what we call aposomatic coloration they're a warning coloration they're telling organisms to stay away and both of them develop a very yellowy, golden, sticky web, which is powerful enough to actually catch birds. Small birds, mind you. But what this spider will do is they'll also lay junk. You can see that up above it and all the way down below it is the carapaces and remains of a number of insects that have been fed upon and uh, digested and then the remains left in situ to sort of advertise the presence of the web when you're walking along you don't really notice the web it's quite difficult to see in the dif in in certain light and uh, so animals will walk straight through it now it is a protein based substance and obviously spiders don't want animals to walk through their web all the time and to take up all the space and to obviously then cause the spider to rebuild the web so they put these junk lines there to sort of make it an obvious visual symbol we believe anyway which we can see which makes it a bit easier for other animals to see it and maybe avoid it Trish you there's a 50% chance of getting the answer right and you went with garden orb spider We'll wait to see if any more answers come through before I give the correct answer. And it is the female. Pitta and Puma, you have got it correct. Your 50% guess has gotten it correct. But it is quite easy to... To identify quite easy to see the difference between the two both of them make very nice golden webs one of them has got a jagged body one has got a smooth round body and if any of you have also guessed and you're still waiting to guess perhaps maybe you have said the garden orb the garden orb is not correct this is the golden orb web spider and it is the female um, they occur here in the summer months when the insect populations are at their highest. The females hatch in the beginning of the rainy season, or should I say the male and females hatch in the beginning of the rainy season. And the females grow exponentially over the months of the rainy season, getting to, what, 200 times or so bigger than the male, who characteristically lives in her web. Um, and then once the rainy season gets towards its end, uh, the female will crawl into one of the trees nearby where the web is attached, lay some eggs, and she will die, uh, perpetuating the cycle of golden orb web spiders through the coming generations. So when you do get some late rain, you can have golden orb web spiders emerging out and sometimes you find the smaller ones it's just blackbird i'm not sure i mean you know the the web itself is quite similar the golden orb web 
the goldenness of the web is quite similar. Although the garden or web spider characteristically puts this, puts this very, what we call, stabilimentum, this very jagged, silver-like zigzag line where that junk line is, uh, whereas the golden orb doesn't seem to do that. They put the junk line there. Although I'm trying to rack my brain to think if I've ever seen a stabilimentum in the web of a golden orb, and I can't remember. Um, but definitely in the garden orbs, that jagged zigzag line, which looks like a silver line of mercury through the web, uh, called the stabilimentum. They, uh, many research papers have hypothesized that the stabilimentum is also a UV sensitive, so it's a UV attraction. So it actually almost serves as a landing strip uh, for insects that are attracted to UV light. And obviously a landing strip landing on a spider's web makes a fair amount of sense. Um, they come in on the landing strip and they get caught in the web. But the name stabilimentum is obviously there as a way of forming stability in the web. That's possibly what it's for, but it definitely has a UV signature. Uh, you can see it's getting to the end of the season. It's got lots of holes in her fishing line and her fishing web, fishing net, sorry. Uh, she needs to do some repair work, but she's probably getting to the end of the season. I mean, she knows it's time to to settle down her life force energy is probably passing and she'll be laying some eggs soon oh, how does that feel everybody do you freak out when you see a spider like this or is it okay Dolly I'm not sure I know that uh, baboon spiders or tarantulas I think male and female are very very similar in size uh, I think most spiders male and female are quite similar I know the, the the golden orb and the garden orb are very characteristically where the female is very large and the male is small I think that's the the, the norm is more balanced but I'm no spider expert but uh, I think the norm is more balanced in the male and female ratio female here builds the web and the male lives his entire life cycle inside the web of the female and his only job is to fertilize her eggs or to pass sperm with his pedipulps to her or she might take the pedi take the sperm with her pedipulps that's his purpose but there are a number of other spider species so I'll have to double check but I think it's more the norm to be more balanced in the size of the sexual dimorphism. <laughs> TD, you're good with spiders until they start moving. Well, thankfully, she is quite busy just hanging out there. As soon as something lands in the web, she'll be very active. She'll go catch it, spin it, catch it in the web, suck out the juices. What a meal. What a meal. Okay, well, that's it for this golden orb web spider. Maybe I've got an image of the garden. Quickly, let me just wipe my screen. I think I might have an image for you of the garden. Oopsie. I did have an image. Just sorting it out quickly. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Technology. There we go. There is the garden orb web spider. You see the abdomen? It's got that very jagged like appearance to it. And uh, you can see that zigzag stabilimentum on the bottom and the top of the spider. They often will position themselves right there in the middle. And uh, obviously if that stabilimentum works as a landing strip, insects are basically coming and landing right in front of them. I've never physically seen that. It's just, just, 
a hypothesis it actually attracts insects to land in the web but you can see the very different body shape on the abdomen there with the jagged garden orb and the golden it's got the nice smooth I suppose gold is nice and smooth and gardens have edges I don't know however you want to remember that be my guest We've got two male giraffe that's actually having a little bit of a, a boxing match here. Look at this. Having a bit of a boxing match. You can see we call it necking, where they'll try and swing their neck and uh, hit their head onto the other one's body, trying to hurt it or topple, it, uh, topple, uh, topple the other one over, or even try and knock the other one out. And they're kind of just shoving each other on their bodies as well. Just trying to like, okay, who's, 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 who's more dominant here? But the one on the right is much bigger than compared to the one on the left, unfortunately. It's just behind the tree now. Um, but this is going to be the best position because they are moving all over the show, so... Oh, a nice little punch. It's almost like this uh, typical heavyweight boxer's... Oh, see that little block, eh? Did you see that block there? Does it look like a little bit of a block? <laughs> this is UFC at its best. You gotta time its, uh, its punch. Does it okay? Yeah, yeah, that one on the right, that that, that young one is quite uh, quite quick. Lola, yes, it is. It's been quite some time. We might have to try and get on the fire break. We'll try and see. What do you think? Yep. Let's try and quickly get on the fire break. Oh, I just want to see. Because they are moving a little bit further away. They are going to disappear from us. So. I'm going to just try see if we can get a better view of these two male giraffes busy having this boxing match. Just trying to work out what's going to be the best here. That side, okay. Beaks, we have got a nice little spot here. Let's see what we can do here. Just want to try and get a better spot to view these two males because it's on the fire break here. La -di -di, la -da -da. More in the open, and we can see a front row seats for this uh, pay per view boxing match. There we go taller one and this younger one is really trying oh, now they're going to be on this <laughs> I might come back out again don't go that way no why are you going in there they might come back out again let's just watch Stand on that road for a while. These two guys aren't giving up. They are not throwing very hard blows. I think they're still young males. They're not fully grown males, uh, these two. 
they're not really throwing that like hard hit. Sometimes when uh, they're really competing for a female, oh, sometimes it can be quite uh, quite vicious with those uh, heads swinging from one side to the other. And you can actually hear the knock against the body. And you see a more kind of aiming in there, so the own little match going on here, but it's nothing too serious. I'm just going to sit here and listen out. It's like they throw like a fake, uh, fake uh, jab. Like they fake it, fake it, and then they throw in the career, the real one. Just like a boxing. Bobbing and weaving. That one's leg out the front left. Mala is almost like a dance routine, but it's not that. It's uh, there's no dancing in this. So the females don't do. That's just the males. That's why you'll find the males have got that pretty much those bald spots on top of the ossicones because of this. Rub pretty much hit the head so the ossicones against the other one's body and it keeps on rubbing rubbing and removing the hair right on off right on top as well as they've got the a very bony heads compared to females and of course the heavier your your head is the bonier your head is and heavier it is the better punch it will pretty much uh, deliver like a bigger punch so And there has been records where they've actually seen a male giraffe knocking the other one out completely, knocking him co out cold. Sometimes they try and go and try and hit the body, I don't know, lift its legs, try and miss, like just like that. Amazing how they do that. Saturday morning pay per view boxing match. Perfect. One's much taller, huh? Well, Zeke, well, that Ossicone is pretty much built up uh, with bone inside. It's just bone. And a, a bone, like a bone extension there. And, um, well, I'm sure it can crack a skull. Maybe not a giraffe skull. Maybe something a little bit lighter. Um, but uh, with that uh, swinging motion and with those two ossicones, I'm sure it'll be quite, it'll deliver quite a bit of a punch, um, you know, if, you, if it hits you. But not, I don't know about another giraffe. It'll crack another giraffe skull. Maybe. Hmm. You can see how quickly they can swing that head. I'm 
clearly you can see the one is much smaller. The one closest to us is smaller than the one at the back. <clears throat> but he's not backing down. Gareth is very calm, but it is calm. Yeah, but it can get quite hectic sometimes when they really go at it. As I say, these two is just more. I don't see too much aggression here. As uh, I've seen, I've seen proper uh, male giraffe fights, you know, necking, and sometimes it can get really, how can I can say, loud when they hit uh, they hit the body with uh, with the head. So. Moment, this is more like kind of a, a shoving match. Even leaning against the poor tree there. Using the tree is almost like a, a leaning post. Pangolins galore, you say he once saw three giraffe. Wow, okay. I can imagine that must have been interesting. And they say two's a company, three's a crowd. Backing off into the tree again. That poor tree is taking a lot of abuse this morning. Like, why me? Why do you have to choose me? I don't think this is going to go on for much longer. I think this is just really an early morning thing, maybe move on again. DJ Lex, I think it's just the pretty much instinct with the giraffes and the males knowing when they start growing up and they start playing with one another. So, you know, like kind of more, you know, playful sparring and all that. And uh, you know, I think they teach themselves. And slowly but surely they learn through experience. More like these two now, as I say, this is not really too serious. So this is more like the, the learning side of things. And 
once they get a little bit older and when they really have to compete with another male then they've really got their their moves their combinations that they're going to use We've got another viewer here. Yeah? That's a, a bit of a supporter. Oh, oh, he's just moved. Sorry. Yeah, I think they're very sharp. He yeah, might come back again. Might just. Uh, yes. Oh, there he is. That's another big fan of uh, boxing. A little dwarf mongoose. I'm just enjoying that little moment there. <laughs> no, don't go now. You're enjoying it. He's like, no, he's done. Amazing. Even while they're busy necking, they still, you've still got the uh, oxpecker that's busy moving up and down on the neck area, on the body and all that. Still busy going for all the, the ticks there. And it's, not really, it's not really bothering the uh, oxpecker birds. Interesting, they're both looking straight into the drainage line there now, eh? Like almost they like picked up on something. Very peaceful scene here with these uh, two giraffes. Absolutely enjoying it. Nice little, nice area as well. A bit of a 
elevated area, but yep, I think they have done their business, finished playing around. Even they put dwarf mongoose, mongoose is, uh, uh, you know, it's going to run. Don't, don't go, don't go. I also enjoyed it with us as well this morning. Did you also enjoy that, uh, that uh, <coughs> necking, eh? <laughs> just sitting on top here, just like, yep. Yeah. <coughs> All by myself. I don't see the rest of the uh, the family. There might be some in the grass. Oh, it's getting in the fright, getting a fright because the gir giraffe is moving through the grass here now. So I don't think they're just like no. All right, let's uh, let us uh, move on. Let us move on. That was nice. Nice to have that. Uh, those giraffes. Let's see. <coughs> Okay, let's go to the Elka Post, yep. I can go down, yeah. Apologize ahead of time. We might have a break, uh, a break in picture. Just heading into the lower areas here, towards Gary Cutline on the fire break. So I'm going to head towards Gary, um, well actually not Gary, I'm going to go to Gary Gate area, so to the northwestern corner. Just going to see, apparently the Talamati Pride was too far from uh, Juma. Watch your seat. Hello everybody, welcome back here live to Juma where a couple mornings ago I was talking about this four-leaf clover and uh, thanks GDH for sending me some information about this uh, water clover, also known as the creeping fern, is Marsilia minuta and it is easily characterized with erect four foliolate leaves um, arising from a solitary uh, solitary from the nodes on the long creeping rhizome. Now the rhizome is an underground storage unit, it's a sort of storage stem. Um, you could say a sweet potato is a rhizome or ginger is a rhizome. And uh, it is planted as an ornamental pot plant around the world, commonly used in garden plant pool decorations. It's quite a wide native range as distributed uh, all the way from India and all the way through Africa. It is not classified as a threatened plant, although it has potential to be a bit of an invasive weed, but it's not very, very concerning. It is edible and it has some medicinal value. The bright green leaves are tender and can be eaten. And an extract of the whole plant is used as an aphrodisiac and for increased fertility. The leaves are pounded, cooked with rice and then eaten as a treatment for indigestion. Uh, the leaf juice is also used to stop nosebleeds and the leaves can be rolled 
in a leaf or shoria robusta and uh, this can be boiled and applied to swollen gums in order to reduce swelling. So quite a useful medicinal plant. Uh, when fed to gerbils they noticed that there was a decrease in um, cholesterol which was more suitable for, for liver health. There we go, the water clover. Thank you, GDH, as always. The family Marsiliaceae. Water clover or creeping fern. Now, Henry, let's just be clear. When I said the word invasive there, I, I didn't mean invasive in that it's coming from outside. It is an indigenous plant that can turn to a weed so it can invade an area but uh, we get different types of plants which are generally termed as invasive and those are generally plants that have been brought in around the world there's a number of areas in the world that have been invaded by plants I'm going to talk about South Africa for example we've got black wattle we've got um, eucalyptus species we've got lantana there's a number of species that didn't occur in South Africa and were brought in. The problem with that is that they have different herbivores that feed on them or not. They have different insects that pollinate them or don't predate on the seeds. So they're basically landing in an environment where nothing has evolved to do anything with them. So they generally are just free reign and they just dominate the landscape. So they invade, they don't have any natural enemies. So when we talk about invasive plants, they generally come from another continent uh, or another country, and there's no biological defense in the area against that plant itself. Um, what we find in many environments in South Africa, the forests, is that they're actually in, in invading the forests on the outskirts and they're causing higher fire index or higher fire risk. Uh, we're finding in the Feinbos biome, uh, where the Feinbos is naturally supposed to burn, we're finding invasive trees moving in that are burning much hotter and for much longer than the fan bushwood. So it's changing the dynamics of the fire intensity and if not frequency in an area and a number of these plant species are fire driven as well. So they are potential, they cause massive potential risk for biodiversity. That's one of the biggest issues with invasive plants is their risk on biodiversity. So you've got to be very careful when bringing plants into an environment. Um, are they invasive? Do they have a potential to invade? And have they been properly studied? A lot of this though happened back in the day when no one was really thinking about it. Now we've got problems all over the world because people trying to bring in some horticultural product or some um, uh, agricultural product or something that they thought was going to be beneficial. Some of them creeped in, for example, Mexican poppy um, and uh, datura. They came in with horse feed from the grasslands of Argentina during the anglo Boer War. They would obviously harvest the grass, make hay bales, bring that over for the horses to feed in South Africa, and those seeds just distributed. And they've become a very big problem in South Africa, even though they have started to become naturalized, which means they've been here for more than 100 years. But high seed loads, no natural enemies, and potential to affect biodiversity which is a big thing biodiversity is basically the major conservation of biodiversity is the major objective in conservation management so important to know the difference between invasive and bush encroachment there are a lot of bush encroachment here and uh, there is invasion of certain plants as well So bush encroachment is generally the densification of an area normally by indigenous plant species and some species are prone to be more uh, bush, bush, bush encroaching than others. The sickle bush for example is one of them and uh, others not so much. A lot of that's to do with management, overgrazing, lack of fire, position of water but many of our rivers are permanent rivers that come from the west they come through agricultural areas that have got invasive species and they come into the rivers of the Kruger National Park 
uh, which is a concern, which is a big concern because you can clean up the Kruger as much as you want to, but they're going to keep coming down stream from further inland. So I've discussed this before, but proper conservation management should mean that we conserve right up to the catchment, right up to where the waterfalls and the springs are coming out of the mountain, all the way to the ocean, because then you can start clearing up the invasive plants at the top and you can come all the way down to the ocean. There's no point starting on the ocean side and going upstream, they're just going to keep coming down. So you've got to start at the top and move down. Australia has demarcated or has, uh, has been practicing this kind of conservation for some time. Catchment management, because obviously all, most of the seeds all flow with the water and they come downstream. So you have to start at the top if you want to be successful. Most of our forested areas down in the Cape, um, all the rivers come from agricultural areas upstream and we have big issues there with black wattle, bugweed, lantana, a number of other species as well. Oh, I'm glad Peter I'm I'm trying to learn something new every day as well and uh, thankfully there's a wealth of knowledge out there and thankfully there's a wealth of uh, individuals who watch this show who also like to share information when they hear me talking about something I just just add something there for you Steve I came across this it was interesting oh I have professors from universities, I have scientists, I have conservationists, I have botanists, I have enthusiasts of all kinds who, who message me and send me information and I am eternally grateful for that everybody, really am. I do accept and appreciate the feedback and the information that's shared. Knowledge is power but wisdom we share. We can hold all the knowledge we want in the world. Who does that benefit? Our ability to share it is wisdom. I love that. I love that. So we're on a road here that cuts through the heart of Juma called Ingwe Alley. A road I haven't checked yet since I've been back. A buffalo came through here at some point last night. So it's a big pile of poo there. And then it's going to bring us through onto the other side. Then we're going to check another road that I don't think has been checked this morning called Rebecca's Road. The reason I tell you this is just because I've been listening to the radio and it's pretty quiet out there. Gert is saying we had our quota of cats yesterday and now they're all gone. Well, that's what happens. But uh, we still want to check all of the ins and out areas to see what shows up and see what's been moving. I don't always believe it when I hear these animals have crossed, these animals have done this or they've done that. I always want to check for myself. Future Bio Girl, you know, many of the medicinal plants that we have in and around the world were, um, were basically just passed on. The information was passed on by human to human for a very long time, the same way elephants do. And a lot of these have actually gone into pharmaceutical studies in labs where they isolate certain compounds. And uh, they know through research what certain compounds mean, uh, this compound combined with that one, what they do. So a lot of the medicinal properties and plants that we have these days have been analyzed and studied. And probably 90%, maybe 95% of pharmaceutical drugs we have on the market have been derived from plants. Uh, many of them have been isolated and then those compounds have been reused. But a lot of it came from plants in the short term or the long term and uh, 
then everybody goes and patents it and says, this is mine, I created this. But actually it was in the vegetation the whole time. So plants carry a wealth of information and a wealth of medicine and all of that stuff is isolated in labs to be tested. But a lot of it was already known by spiritual healers, traditional healers through the eons. And science has gone and looked at some of them and correlated that yeah, actually, yes, this can be used to treat cancer. This can be used for that because of the isotopes and all of those little funny words that you find when looking in a microscope. Lots of buffalo poo. Let's try not to drive in it. The reports of the buffalo went into Little Gowrie, but the buffalo all seems to have gone that way. So, I don't know. I haven't gone north. I haven't gone very far east. I have a feeling like that herd of buffalo probably crossed the Milwati or headed towards Gauri Dam at least maybe up towards Bovosuk side into the north. But all over, buffalo is all over this morning. Alright, so I'm, I just want to get down to the southwestern corner. Um, as I said, there was reports of uh, Shudulu and Nene being around there close to close to Juma. Um, a little bit further into Hoffmans, but maybe there might be a visual from, uh, from the service road. So I'm going to just try and get down there and to see if we can get any visual on, uh, on those leopards. Which will be lovely, but oh, the wind is now just come in and it is very chilly. It's nice and very, it's actually quite cool. Like a nice little cold front that's uh, hit here today. Because when we got up and uh, it was, you know, you could see the stars, it was clear, clear skies, and then it was like one, just one huge front coming through. There's another herd of buffaloes coming in here because there's more tracks on here on this road. Another other herd of buffaloes went straight south into Little Gowrie, way further south. But uh, let's just take a look. Maybe we get an, another herd of buff here. I think, I think this weather has really made all the animals very sleepy this morning. I think that's why they're not even coming out at all. I think this uh, windy, cold uh, breeze and uh, cold weather. Yeah, I think everyone, all the animals are like, nah, you know what, we are going to just, it's a Saturday morning. We are all going to try and uh, rest under a nice little thick, uh, thick area somewhere here and keep warm and... Uh, Enjoy our morning, except our, of course, our two boxes, the two giraffe that decided to, you know, entertain us for the morning. Scarlet do buffalo vocalize a lot when they move. Yeah, they do. They got Yep. 
<laughs> oh, they suck. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's what happens when they're moving. They're all um, moving around, uh, all vocalizing around the side. <laughs> Oh, another giraffe. Now this time it's a female. Oh, she's just running. All right, uh, don't run. <laughs> oh, no, she's a little bit, uh, a little bit shy. Do you want to see? Hey, good morning. Oh, let me shy. How are you doing this morning? Uh, you know, you can just see those Aussie cones on her top of her head compared to those males, nice and thin with that hair on top, completely different. And those males, wow, oh, those birds shouting here. Yeah. See, she's also looking directly in that spot. <laughs> now she's looking at us. It's always nice to look at giraffe and sometimes they can give you the warning of uh, a predator close by. You know, they've got such uh, they've got good eyesight plus they're very tall and nicely elevated so they can see much further than what we can. And anyway, a giraffe does see maybe something walking in the grass somewhere. Always will give us an idea where and uh, how intensely are they looking into that area then as well gives us a sort of that uh, understanding if there is something that's dangerous around here. Yeah. I'm not too sure if we are if still alive, I don't know, because uh, there we are. I almost thought we lost uh, Gwen as our director. Candy, the main is, uh, well, it's, there's no real purpose for it. I mean, the giraffe's main, as you can see, it's very small. Very, very short. It's not that long manes like the horse and the giraffe. Uh, zebra, very really short little manes running all the way down. Not really any purpose for it. Why are you looking so there, girl? What have you? What do you see that, that we don't see? Hmm? Hmm? Right, clearly, he's not too focused on that spot. Looks like it was a giraffe Saturday morning. A giraffe morning. <laughs> Don't usually have those kind of drives. Oh, I don't know. I don't know where Equin has gone. Anyway, let's uh, let's continue to see if we can get down. Let's go down to the southwestern corner. I go. Oh, there you are, Gwen. I did not get any question or comment there. Sorry. Very quiet.
All right, so I think while we're trying to get to that southwestern corner, hopefully for Shadulu and Nene, let's head over to Steve. Welcome back, everyone. We had a, a runner out in the open here. And now he's decided he's going to be shy and move in to the thickets. Nice big bull. Let me see if I can reposition. Maybe we get another view of him. I don't think. I don't think so, though. He's quite relaxed. There we have got a rhino bottom. The classic African salute, everybody. Nice big male rhino mowing the lawn. Unable to overgraze. Ecological role. Just keeping the grass nice and short. Facilitating the feeding of other grazing animals. Okay, well, I'm not going to follow him any further. Unfortunately, that was the best of him and the end of him. Samantha, always a good day when you see a rhino. Yeah, they are very special. They are very nice to see. Going to carry on along here, head on over towards the west. Nicole. Well a big male rhino gets up to about three and a half thousand kilograms. Big rhino, and a, a, a medium-sized female is a similar weight, but obviously she's much taller. I mean, a male elephant gets to about four, four and a half meters at the shoulder, four meters at the shoulder. Female three and a half, three, uh, whereas a white rhino stands at about 1.6. So he's tall. He's tall. He's about just under my, just under my height if I'm standing. Much bigger than you think, but solid, solid little tanks. So obviously elephants are bigger and heavier. Uh, rhino ca cows smaller than the males, of course. And black rhinos are probably half the weight, half the weight, half the size. Still formidable, still over a ton, metric ton. And very quick, very, very quick. Hey, what? always fascinates me about a rhino like that is he can be in one spot and he can turn 360 degrees or 180 degrees like that on a penny it was the most remarkable thing to see imagine this vehicle just being able to turn 180 degrees the other way it's essentially what's happening jink, jink. with the danger end here you think ah oh, he's not facing me he just turns the other way unreal a buffalo can't do that. A buffalo has to do this like loping around, whereas a rhino can just spin. It is unreal to see. Have you seen that, Gat? Luckily, we're not for die. Back in the day when I started guiding in the Kruger, there were a lot of rhino and we used to walk them every single day. And I learned that, I learned that firsthand once. <laughs> how quickly they can suddenly present their danger end. That's very special. Very special to, to approach a rider on foot. If the wind is in your favor, you can really sneak up on them. It's 
been some years now, I think, since I've walked around it. So we're going to head over towards the west. It's a uh, beautiful, cool morning. Definitely going to have breakfast and then rest a bit before my exercise. It's not warm, that warm that I need to do the exercise before breakfast. Although those days do happen. Cheers, everybody. I hope you're having a wonderful Saturday. A wonderful Easter Saturday with family friends, your pets, whatever it is you find yourself doing today, wishing you a magical day. William, I like it when it's like this um, in the morning because it's a little, little bit windy, not too windy. I don't like a lot of wind. A little bit cooler. Uh, it means that you could potentially still have your predators moving. Um, and I like to find predators. Uh, when you're walking as well, I love to walk. Walking safaris are my thing. When the temperatures are cooler, it's much better. You don't normally get this kind of weather in the winter months though when I do most of my walking but every now and again you do get a day or two like this but uh, it's not great for photography when lights is like this but um, I quite like being out and about when it's just a little bit overcast and a little bit cooler because it means you can spend longer out there because you can spend longer out there you can go longer distances and you have more potential to find other animals when it gets hot and it's early and it's hot, animals are just going to be sleeping and well, unless you go to a water point, you're not really going to see much. Welcome back everybody, we're heading over towards the west, don't think anybody's been here this morning, I could be wrong, looks like someone might have driven through. question Carl I don't have an answer for you I don't have an answer there isn't there's never been a set frequency uh, essentially uh, roads in a reserve should be maintained before the rainy season and then as the rainy season sort of ends they then get done again um, I and mean, what I mean by that is that the mitre drains need to be open the bolsters, which are the bumps, need to be maintained and in good working order. And the grass along the front cut. Bumps repaired, ruts repaired, all of that repaired before the next onset of the rainy season happens. So normally a lot of the maintenance happens in the winter months. Uh, and if not, just before the onset of the rainy season. Every year should be the case. Some, some reserves are, are much more on it than others. But it is beneficial to your vehicles, it's beneficial to the reserve, it's beneficial to the environment to, to keep on top of the road because essentially what this road creates is a, a, a pathway and water always goes the easiest route and water that picks up speed, picks up soil, and causes erosion which can lead to 
irreparable damage, which is going to cost lots of money to fix. Okay, well, sounds like Cedric's got some birds. Let's go quickly see what he's found. A little bit of a bird party going here, a lot of uh, glossy starlings, there was a crested barbet here as well and it seems like a little bit of a, a nice bird party happening here on the, on the southwestern corner of Juma. Very nice, I'm hoping that they will invite us one day. But yeah, just a quick update, I just want to say thank you for helping us to get uh, up to the 130,000 US dollar mark uh, for the donations. We are going to keep uh, donations drive going while we try and build a war chest until Sunday next week the 7th of April on that day we will have a town hall to regroup and explain what has developed over the last two weeks and chart a way forward so please as well keep on signing the petition as well and we need at least around about 10,000 uh, signatures on this on the petition against a multi -cho uh, multi choice so yes thank you so much for those donations i'm so glad that we have reached that uh, 100 uh, 130,000 us dollar mark but we are going to continue with that all right <clears throat> Let's uh, move on. Right, if you want to know where to do, uh, donate and all that and jump, jump on board, just go onto our website, wilders.tv, and just go onto the donate link, and then you'll get more information on that. All right, let's move on. Let's slowly head slowly back to Camp's Hide. Let's see what's happening there. No luck on Shudulu and Nene. No luck. No idea where they've disappeared to. So I'm going to go up Zoe's and, uh, yeah, as I said, let's see what we can find up that side. And uh, Rusty is starting to sound very rusty. As, uh, this uh, squeaky squeaky is uh, just getting worse and worse. Huh. Uh, I think, I think uh, it might be like the fan belt. I don't feel like a fan belt. They're like a chicka 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 chicka. It's just getting very, very loud at times. So I do apologize about that noise. If you can hear it, you can hear it, eh? Yeah, you can hear it, eh? I'm sure you can hear it, uh. Uh, goes up and down uh, Gwyn, so it's loud sometimes and then it's soft and it's loud I yeah, know it's funny it's all the squirrels inside there I can't copy her. Sorry, Gwen. It's uh, anyway. I think she's. Uh, I think Gwen said something like she's also had that problem before. Sometime with uh, her car making a noise. Oh, you once had that issue, and, <laughs> and it scared you because you were a new driver. I can imagine. Imagine you just started uh, driving and all of a sudden you got those funny squeaks and you think to yourself Is it me? Have I forgot to do something? Have I forgot to put down the handbrake? Was I supposed to oil a wheel? Do something Uh, no, it's not it's not pleasant when you got these little noises coming out. I'm very I'm very picky. That's one thing when it comes to squeaks and rattles on a car well unfortunately i can't be very picky on this on, <laughs> on rusty because rusty's just got squeaks and rattles everywhere but uh whenever with my own car then if i've got like if i'm driving and i hear like a gee -gee -gee -gee, or like a little rattle somewhere on the vehicle uh, i have to get it sorted out i i don't do little rattles and squeaks and all that but uh yeah that's all right rusty is the exception there's, there's no there's no winning the, that battle with Rusty. No, no ways. 
<laughs> and so I think the cruises are going to be quite nice. Uh, they're going to be also nice and silent and uh, not as many rattles. Yeah, I know. I should ignore it. I know if it sounds too expensive, just ignore it. But I agree. Thank you for that uh, that uh, motivation for the morning. Just uh, if it's too expensive, ignore it. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that was the biggest thing with me when I when I started here in 2010 in the Northern Sands. I had myself it was a Golf 2, a Golf 2, and um, coming towards the gate, Gary Gate, to head towards the lodge I was working at at uh, in Koro, I remembered now when I was coming towards Gary Gate, um, it, the, the road was absolutely horrendous, like so many bumps and. Uh, corrugation and everything eventually my entire uh, dashboard was coming loose eventually I had to kind of hold my dashboard against the you know like tight against the, the the window area so it won't fall onto my lap because the thing was bouncing and it seems like the whole dashboard was like going there and my steering wheel was going <laughs> <It's eventually. laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I know that was. I think maybe I've got that. Uh, maybe this is why I've got this knack of always holding this. Yeah, because it's like <laughs> it became a habit, and uh, just holding maybe the dashboard tight enough, uh, keeping it in place. So. <laughs> I was trauma. I was still traumatized from that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh no. <clears throat> no, no, I had to get rid of that car very quickly. I knew if I had to keep that vehicle, yeah, in the, in this area, and if I have to go back and forth every time uh, with that, I would have lost the, I would have lost the entire vehicle. <laughs> now, uh, this area, yeah, you can't have a small car. You got another little Golf for Polo. Mm -hmm. No. Caden, yeah, no, rusty has got a personality to it. You gotta have to, you gotta love the squeaks. Oh yes, oh uh, yes. Every day is a new squeak, a new rattle somewhere, somewhere. But that's that's typical with uh, with Rusty. Rusty is like that. So yeah. Without that, it won't be Rusty. Yeah. It's gonna be it's gonna be very strange driving those cruises, and it's gonna feel so like. Like floating, you know, silent, and it's the shocks work. Well, that's where I'm going to miss Rusty because Rusty is like you got this rattles, and plus the sh there's hardly any shocks in this vehicle. Oh, so much longer. Oh, the, the cruisers are way longer, uh, Gwyn. Uh, no, no, this is a short wheel base. Cruisers are a normal long wheel base that's so, no, much much longer. It's a tank, but I'm so used to driving cruisers, always at lodges. When I was working at all the lodges and all that, it was always the, the land cruiser was the was the vehicle to drive, so uh, luckily I'm used to them. Alright, while we slowly make our way to uh, the campsite, let's head over to Steve. Here we go. We've done the western side and uh, quite uneventful. You know, on days like this, it can either be pumping with game or it can be off. It's just the way it goes. There's no set way that things work out in the wild places yesterday morning. There was an abundance of wildlife. We shook a tree yesterday and something fell out of it. This morning, not so much. But it is the way it works. It's the way the cookie crumbles, so they say.
nice and calm indeed perky nice and calm sunrise indeed although we didn't see the sunrise it did come up there's nothing stopping the sun rising Helen, like chalk and cheese from yesterday. Nice calm start. But you never know, we've got a minute or so left of drive. There's always that opportunity for a last minute something. What could that something be? It's been a nice slow start to the weekend, a nice relaxed Saturday morning activity. We hope you've enjoyed the sunrise safari here on this Easter Saturday, public holiday, wherever you are in the world. Don't forget, we'll be live from Juma this afternoon. Don't forget, on safari starts at 3 o'clock and then the sunset safari from 3.30. We look forward to having you there. Thank you for your questions and enjoy your magical Saturday. Whatever it is you get up to, we'll catch you later. Goodbye for now.